So we are starting a new chapter this evening. Starting a new chapter is always an exciting moment in the process of learning, particularly in learning Tanya, because it's, uh, there's so much information packed into every single chapter that when you get the opportunity to move to a new chapter, it indicates that you've made great progress. So that's what we're doing. We're about to start a new chapter. Chapter we're going to begin this evening is chapter 5. And chapter 5 picks up on the theme that we wrapped w- chapter 4 with. So let's just review. In chapter 1, we were introduced to the principle that much to people's surprise, we are not a soul and a body. We're actually two souls battling for control of a body. We haven't really spoken much about the battle for control. That's still to come. But the, 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 the message is that we have two souls. One is a divine soul. One is an animalistic soul. And they produce very different behaviors and very different aspirations. And so we spoke in chapter 1 at the end about the nature of the animal soul. Then the entire chapter 2 was, just, was dedicated to explaining the nature of the godly soul, the divine soul. Chapter 3 told us about the breakdown of the various characteristics that comprise this divine soul. And chapter 4 is where we started to make a transition. And it's a really important transition. It's a transition that leads us to this chapter. It's all very well to talk about the fact that we have an ashamah to describe the fact that we have a soul and that the soul is divine and that it shares DNA with God himself. Literally, a piece of God that lives inside of us. That is very inspiring. You know what the problem is with inspiration? Inspiration doesn't guarantee anything. You feel very good in the moment. It's very inspiring. It's very uplifting. You get very excited. But there's no guarantee that just because a person is inspired that they will, in fact, move, change, grow, develop. So we need more than inspiration. Chapter 2 and chapter 3, and the first half of of chapter 4, gave us inspiration, because it is inspiring to know that we have such a powerful soul. And it is inspiring to know that we are part of God. And it is inspiring to know that that soul has these various facets that comprise the character of the soul. And it's very inspiring to know that the soul is a means of connection with our world, thought, speech, and action. The question is now, what do you do with that? What do you do with that information? Or to put it differently, how do you activate the power of your soul? How do you create the, the, the path to experience the value that the soul has to offer? How do you do it? What do you need to do? And so towards the end of the last chapter, we started to speak about the power of Torah. Because Torah is the catalyst. And mitzvahs allow us the opportunity for connection. So we started to talk along those lines that our neshama really only comes to life when we engage with the Torah, which is Hashem's wisdom encapsulated in book form. And when we follow his mitzvahs, which are the places that Hashem stretches his hand out to us and says, here, grab onto this, because this will allow you an opportunity to connect with me. And effectively, we've, we've opened ourselves to this, this line of thought, which says, if you really want to activate and experience your neshama, these are the methods, the Torah and the mitzvahs. In this chapter, we're going to focus specifically on the power of Torah learning. And we already touched on the fact that many people think that Torah learning is just about gaining knowledge and becoming wise and understanding this ancient system of morality and of spirituality, which is all true. And none of that captures the real essence and, by extension, the real power of the Torah. So this chapter takes us on a journey of experience of what the Torah has to offer us. And on that journey, we're going to do a few things that perhaps you've been waiting a long time to do without even realizing that they're on the agenda. You know, that's what happens sometimes. Sometimes a person offers you the solution to a problem that you didn't know that you had. So this is one of those scenarios. You know, we're going to address issues in our study about the Torah, we're going to address certain issues that perhaps have bothered you and perhaps haven't bothered you, but they should have bothered you. For example, one of the big issues that we'll tackle early on in the chapter is, why is so much of the Torah fixated on scenarios that will never happen? 
That's both in the scriptural writings and in, in, in the actual written Torah, as it is in rabbinic law, like the Gemara. So I don't know how much Gemara you've learned, but let me tell you, sometimes you really wonder what kind of imagination did those sages have? Because the scenarios that they present, which are supposed to be halachic scenarios, you and I know will never occur. So why do they get so much airtime? Even the Torah itself. Very often the Torah either tells us about halachic scenarios that will never happen, okay, maybe not often, but occasionally. Like the case of what's called the Ben Sorer Umoire. That's a child who in a very short six-month window has to become such a delinquent that he holds his parents to ransom and he eats fortunes of uncooked meat. Okay, maybe in South Africa that's a possibility. And he drinks way too much wine and he's got to be executed. And we're told that it never occurred, yet the Torah dedicates time to it. Or the Torah will tell us about various scenarios or even people who don't seem to have any relevance in our lives. As the Rambam famously writes, there's a verse in the Torah, Vachois Loiton Timna. That's the whole verse. That Loiton, who was an obscure individual that none of us really know anything about, early biblical character, had a sister whose name was Timna. Says the Rambam, if you feel that that line in the Torah is irrelevant, then you are effectively a heretic. Because everything in the Torah has value. So we're going to explore that value. And hopefully the early part of this chapter will radically shift our appreciation for why we learn Torah and how we learn Torah. The other thing we're going to do early on in the chapter is to describe how the Torah affects us. In other words, when we learn Torah, how it affects us in a way that is far more profound than any other spiritual experience. Now, that doesn't mean that when you learn Torah, you will suddenly feel all of these things happen. You know, that's one of the problems that we have. We judge the value and the depth of an experience based on our feelings. And it doesn't always work that way, you know. Sometimes you don't feel something just simply because you're overtired, not because there's something wrong with the experience. Sometimes you don't feel anything because you're just insensitive to that particular kind of nuance of spirituality. It's not a, it's not a valid, objective measure of the value of things. So we're going to talk about that as well. What does the Torah offer us that no other spiritual experience offers at all? And in order to, <clears throat> in order to get to that, that's where we're going to start the chapter. In order to get to that, we're going to use a word. It's an interesting word because it's used in English just as well as it, as it is used in Hebrew and in Aramaic. And it's a word that is so tangible and physical on the one hand, and yet it's a word that we use to describe a very intangible and abstract experience, the experience of understanding. So isn't it interesting how often we use expressions in English about understanding that are really physical expressions? Like, for example, we say, do you have a handle on this? Now, in Gomorrah language, they say the same thing. Ein beyodenu. The concept is not in our hands. Very interesting that you would use that kind of expression. So the particular expression that we're going to focus on right at the beginning of this chapter is the expression grasp. So a teacher might say to the students, do you grasp this idea? Obviously, in, in more modern terms, they probably say, did you get it? Did you get that? But the concept of grasping an idea is interesting because grasping is very physical, right? It's, it's what you do with your hand. You grasp something with your hand. And you know what else is interesting about grasping onto something or clasping onto something? Sometimes it's not clear if you're in control or if it is in control. So, for example, you, you shake hands with somebody. There's a whole science of analyzing handshakes. Did they put their hand like this? Dominate, do, dominating personality, domineering personality? Did they put their hand like this? Somebody's got a low self-esteem. Did they shake your hand like this? The politician handshake, which effectively means that they're just trying to please you. Did they bring their hand down at you? Did they put it straight? Did they yank you towards them? Right? It's a whole science of analyzing handshakes. So even though the idea of a handshake is supposed to be this mutual connection between two people, the reality is it's not always so mutual. <laughs> you know, sometimes 
It's one person who's taking control of the situation. So you might be a very outgoing, friendly person. You extend your hand. Your intention is to build a bridge between you and the other person. They grab your hand and yank it towards them. Their intention is to take control. So grasping is a fascinating experience because even if I'm the one who took the initiative, who took that step, who reached out to grasp, the truth of the matter is, Sometimes the subject grasps me more than I grasp the subject. Now, if that sounds really far-fetched, let's think about how it works when you're learning. So, in today's world, thank God, most people do not have the following issue. And the reason most people don't have this issue is because Baruch Hashem, in today's world, we have chopped everything, out of, they call it bite-sized pieces. I think it's even smaller than bite-sizes. In today's world, everything is chopped into these micro as they call them, micro-statements, micro-concepts. And that's how we ingest information. So we get these sound bites, and we get these tidbits, and we get these memes. And that's how we process information. Once upon a time, not so long ago, people used to get information through research. I don't know if you've heard of this. And research wasn't typing something into a search bar on the internet. Research meant you went to a library, and you had to look you know, to find the correct books, and you had to pull the book out of the shelf, sit down at a table, flip through the pages till you found the correct place, and then you actually had to take copious notes from whatever it was that you were researching, and then you had to find other books, and, and so on and so forth. Sometimes you could become so engrossed in your research that you would lose track of time or you would lose awareness of what was going on around you. Now, try and explain that concept to the average kid who was born after 1990. I don't know what you're talking about. You know? <laughs> what do you mean you could get completely absorbed into a topic and you don't know what's happening around you? That is when you grasp the concept so deeply that the concept now holds you. That's where we're going to begin our journey of appreciating what the Torah does for us in terms of our spiritual experience, an unparalleled spiritual experience. Perek, hey, chapter 5. Now, the way that this chapter starts is quite interesting. It starts with an and, which is always unusual, but that tells you, of course, that it's a direct flow from what we concluded in the preceding chapter. What did we conclude in the preceding chapter? That it doesn't matter how many layers there are to the Torah. When you learn the Torah, it is an embrace with God. Much like if you had to embrace the king, nobody would then analyze afterwards how many layers of clothing was the king wearing. So the implication is that when you learn Torah, it is a direct connection to the source. That's what you're doing. You're plugging in directly to the source and you're embracing the source. So it doesn't matter if the Torah that you're learning is the secrets of the deepest mystical parts of Kabbalah or if the Torah that you're learning is how to calculate whether or not the Eruv in your area is kosher. It actually doesn't make a difference. Each piece of Torah is direct access to this divine embrace. We're now going to understand that better and deeper. And so therefore he starts this chapter by saying, biur, To further explain what we've begun to explore in the previous chapter. So we ended the previous chapter talking about this unique relationship that we can forge between ourselves and God each time that we learn Torah. Let's explain this further. And the next two words that the Alter Rebbe will use are two words that encapsulate the entire approach of the Hasidus that he developed. Hasidus Chabad. Two words. It's amazing how sometimes you can have two words that are so indicative, so illustrative. One phrase that tells you everything that you need to know about this process. What are those two words? Ba'er hativ. To explain well. Or to explain thoroughly. You know, it's very unfortunate how much Judaism is transmitted from one generation to the next generation, from teacher to student, and it's not ba'er hativ. It's without thorough explanation. And that's probably the reason why it is that so many people in our community have so many areas of Judaism that they don't really understand properly. Even facts. There's certain basic facts of Judaism that people just simply don't know because 
We're not good at the ba'er hetev, a good, thorough, meaningful explanation of concepts. What are we used to? What are we good at? Ah, here's the idea. Let's move on. You know, the other day, somebody made a comment, and I, I, thought, it was, I thought it was incredible. Somebody made a comment, a colleague of mine, that he studies what we call daf yomi. So daf yomi is a very well-known method of studying the entire Talmud in the course of seven years. And the way you do it is you study two pages a day. And that way you cover it over the course of seven years. So this rabbi tells me that there's a fellow who's been studying the daf yomi in this particular cycle. So it means he's been studying. At this point, he would have studied uh, a whole series of tractates, probably about a dozen tractates by now. This is the current cycle. And the fellow asked the rabbi a particular question. What does this phrase mean? The phrase that he didn't know is a phrase that is used commonly in the entire Talmud. That means that somebody has ostensibly learned, call it a dozen tractates of the Talmud, without decoding one of the key phrases that you need to have to understand all of that stuff. So that's what happens. We don't necessarily do ba'er hatev. We don't necessarily explain concepts thoroughly. And one of the great things that Dalter ever wanted to achieve with Chabad Hasidus is ba'er hatev. Whatever topics we're going to explain, they need to be thoroughly explained to the extent that a person understands them well. There are many things that we understand generically. The goal of Chabad Hasidus is to take spiritual concepts and ensure that we understand them well. And that's why you will notice consistently through Tanya and other books of Chabad Hasidus that terms are used very carefully. Whereas sometimes in other books of Torah, terms could be used quite colloquially. Now, we've already experienced that in our study of Tanya. Because in chapter 1, one of the very first lessons that we learned was that everybody uses the word tzaddik quite colloquially. And everybody uses the word rasha quite colloquially. And tzaddik turns out in, in modern expression, in common parlance, a tzaddik is a good person. A person is very religious, very learned. And a rasha is a bad person, a person who rebels, a heretic, an atheist, a criminal, anything like that. So one of the first things that Dalta Rebbe did for us in chapter 1 was to say, now let's really understand what is a tzaddik for real? What is a rasha for real? And with that, he set the tone for how we're going to learn right throughout Tanya and all the other subsequent books of Chabad Hasidus. We're not going to satisfy ourselves with generic uh, terminology, with generic definitions. We're going to ba'er hatev. We're going to take a concept and explain it thoroughly. In this particular case, the word that we want to explain thoroughly is loshoin tfisa, the expression to grasp. Now, where do we come across the expression to grasp? It's quoted in the Zohar, and this is where we're re- referencing over here. She'omar Eliyahu leis machshava tfisa boch chulei. So, this is a quotation from an early part of the Zohar, which is attributed to the prophet Elijah, Eliyahu Hanavi, who, as we know, used to train personally, some of the great Kabbalists, even though Eliyahu had passed away. But we know that Eliyahu is one of those individuals who never quite passed away. He's the one human being who went into heaven alive and he keeps coming back to visit. So he comes at Pesach and he goes to Bristol's and then he appears in strange places in disguise and, and all kinds of things. So one of the jobs that Eliyahu has is to teach mystical secrets to the great Kabbalists. So therefore, he is quoted early on in the Zohar as saying that the definition of God, and we already quoted this in the previous chapter, is Leis machshava, no intellectual process, or if you want to say generically, thought, but really no intellectual process at all, Tfisa Bach can grasp you, God. So that was an important conversation we had in the previous chapter. We said it's impossible to grasp Hashem. And we described why that is, because Hashem is fundamentally infinite, and the process of grasping slash understanding is to define so if something is infinite, it cannot be defined. So therefore, lace machshava tvisa. There's no intellectual process that can grasp God. But then we said, Ki'im We said when a person grasps knowledge from the Torah or 
participates in doing a mitzvah, then you have access to Hashem. You grasp the information, and through that you have direct access to Hashem. So we use this term grasp, and now we want to unpack it and understand more fully what does it mean to grasp. In order to get to understand that, we're going to have a little bit of a tongue twist over here. It would be a nice thing to test everybody afterwards who could say this next piece the fastest because it's not only a tw- tongue twister, but it's actually a mind bender. And we're going to, using this tongue twister slash mind bender, we're going to understand what does it mean to understand. How do you know if you've understood something? That's the question. How do you know if you've understood something? Okay, so before we read it inside, I remember we had a teacher and our teacher used to say that the way that you know that you've learned the Gomorrah properly is that if I would arrive, he would say, if I would arrive at your house in the middle of the night, wake you up in the middle of your sleep and ask you a question about this particular Gomorrah, you would be able to answer the question. That's how we would know that you really have consolidated the information. I heard a quotation attributed to Einstein. I don't know if it's a true quotation or not, but it's a good quotation. He said, you know that you've understood something properly if you could explain it to your grandmother. In other words, the point is, how do you know that you've really grasped something? Not because you've read it and then closed the book and said, wow, that was interesting. Because there's a fascinating thing that happens that might have happened to you. Maybe it hasn't happened to you. Maybe it only happens to other people. But there's this fascinating phenomenon that as you close a book, even though you, while you were reading it, everything was so clear and you were convinced that you'd remember it forever, somehow as you close the book, there's some mental switch that happens that erases 90% of the information that you've just studied. And that's why revision is so valuable because it's a funny thing. You sit in a lecture, and while the person is talking, what they're saying is so logical and so compelling and so inspirational that you tell yourself, I will never forget this. I'm going to keep this information in my mind, locked away safely forever. And then you walk out, it's gone. So we want to analyze at this point in Tanya, how do you ensure that information that you've learned is information that you keep? So let's have a look. He's going to describe for us the intellectual process. Hine, this is how it works. Kol seichel. Any intellect. If you want to understand a concept, you're going to use intellect. So any intellect. Keshema skill. When the intellect operates the processes of intellect. Maskil. Okay, so seichel is the organ, seichel is the, is the hardware. People have different levels of seichel, different styles of seichel. One person's intellect is very analytical, another person's intellect is very creative, another person's intellect is philosophical. That's the hardware. Maskil is when it is in process. So every time that a person tries to either learn something, contemplate something, invent something, solve something, they are maskil. The intellectual process is working. So in a kol seichel, any intellect, ke maskil, when it is in process, when it is active, or masig, and it is trying to reach. That's actually what the, what the word masig means, to reach. So you've got a particular intellectual objective. You want to solve this problem understand that concept, uh, contemplate that philosophy. So now you want to masig, you want to reach it. How will you reach anywhere in the intellectual world? You'll reach there using that hardware, using the tool of intellect. And what is your objective called? Eze muskal. Muskal is an intellectual concept. So we've got three words over here. Seichel, maskil, and muskol. Seichel is the hardware, the brain, for the purposes of our conversation, even though seichel is not the organ. Seichel is the intellect that that organ processes. Maskil is when you've activated the mind. And muskol is the concept that you'd like to understand, which initially is probably quite elusive. 
So how does the process work? How does the seichel get the muskal inside the mind? So this is how it works. Harei ha seichel toifeses ha muskal. This is very similar to a physical process. Let's say that there's a, a physical item. Let's just say that wherever you're sitting right now, let's just say that on the table in front of you, there's a pen, there's a phone, there's an apple, whatever it is. And you want that apple. You want that pen. So you're sitting wherever you're sitting. The pen, the apple, or whatever object it is that's sitting in front of you is a certain distance away. It could be 10 centimeters, 50 centimeters away. You want it. So what do you need to do? There is the person. The person is the one who would like the item. There is the item, that's the objective. And then there's the process. In this case, the process is you extend your arm, you take your hand, close your hand onto the pen, pick it up, and bring it back. So we all understand how the process is supposed to work. Originally, the pen was out there, where I didn't have the, the capacity to write because the, the pen was sitting on the table. And now using the hardware at my disposal, I've reached out, grasped and grabbed the pen, brought it into the space where I could use it, now I could write. So, how does it work with intellect? I have the capacity for intellect. Out there is a concept that I'd like to understand. So I'm going to use my brain to do something very similar to what my hand would do to the pen. I want my brain to stretch itself into the world where that intellectual information sits. And then I want my brain firstly to grasp it. So, the first thing that has to happen is my intellect has to grasp the topic. So, how do you grasp a topic? How do you grasp an idea? Through learning, right? So what's the first step? That first step of grasping. Let's talk from the... I'm just going to change angles for a second because sometimes when you look at it from a different angle, that actually helps. So at this point, we're looking at it from the angle of the learner. Let's just switch it for a second to the angle of the teacher. Now, you don't have to have a teacher in order to learn. You could learn from a book. But the book will be the teacher in this context. And sometimes you won't even learn something from a book. You'll contemplate yourself and using your own intellect, you'll ask questions and think about possible scenarios and eventually come to a solution that you think actually makes sense. So let's say there's a teacher and let's say there's a book. They have to produce a product, either the written word or the spoken word, that will make my brain want to catch that information. Once you've got my interest, I want to catch that information. Sounds interesting. Sounds good. So I want it. Now the thing is this. If you stop at that point in time where you've just chapped the idea, that's the worst time to stop. And it's the most common time to stop. Oh, got it. I know exactly what you mean. Ever seen somebody do that? I know exactly what you're talking about. High rate of disconnect. Because I've jumped so quickly to a point of satisfaction that I haven't made sure to actually take the item with me. You know, you know those uh, arcade things that they get with the, the claw and the, the fluffy toys? You put in money and then you've got to control the, the robotic claw and then you drop it down and you pick up the teddy bear, right? So it's obviously designed in such a way that a good portion of the people never get the teddy bear. And one of the reasons that people don't get the teddy bear is because as soon as they've caught it, so they're so careful manipulating the, the arm and the claw and the whole thing till they're in exactly the right position, and then they drop the thing down, they catch the, the teddy bear, and what do they do? What, what do most people do? They then yank the arm up. Because <laughs> success, right? I was toy face. I grasped what I wanted to grasp. So what do I do? You yank it up, and that's when it falls. That's when it goes flying. Ah, I know exactly what you mean. It's like, you often see this, you know, when, when people are studying together. So the teacher will say something, 
and midway through that sentence, somebody will cut it and say, yes, that's exactly what it says in such and such a place. That is the person who is guaranteed to learn the least. Because they keep jumping in. So they're not toy face what the learning is. Instead, they keep going back and circling back to what they already know. And, and that's not how you learn. You never learn by revisiting what you already know. You learn specifically by being open to new things. So toy face is how The first thing you've got to do is you got to, there has to be connection. Do you remember those old dial-up modems? Remember, that, remember when internet first started? He had the modem and he used to go, like made a whole noise, you know, ting, ting, ting. Remember that? That's when you're trying to be toy face. <laughs> you're trying to create the connection. You're trying to initiate the download. But real understanding requires the next step, which is, umakifoi besichloi. Your intellect has to completely envelop the concept. So in plain English, it means you have to hold tight. Let's say that it was the pen, right? Let's say the pen is on your table and you want to get the pen. Some people are clumsy. It's just the way that it is. So they'll be busy watching the, the, the shear that we're doing now and they'll reach out without really paying attention to the pen and they'll pick up the pen and no sooner do they have it, they'll drop it. Because they're a bit clumsy or distracted or you know, not really paying attention to what they're doing. Makifoi basichlo means I have to hold the pen properly. I have to have a proper grip on that pen. And then I can hold it and then I can write with it. That's why it's a whole, that whole OT thing, you know, about making sure that kids know pencil grip and all that kind of stuff. Because if you don't, you're going to drop the pen at some point. So that's makifoi biyodoi. That would be where your hand completely encompasses the pen appropriately. Now you're holding on to it. Your brain has to do a similar thing. Your mind has to encompass the topic. Now, it's really easy to understand how that works with your hand and a pen. It's easy to understand because you can visualize it. There's the pen. This is my hand. I know what a pencil grip looks like. So I grab the pen in this particular way. Bingo! You've done it. Fantastic. What does it look like with your mind? What does it look like when your mind has enveloped or encompassed a concept. What does it look like? So you know what it looks like? It looks like what the Secret Service agents say. You know, what do the Secret Service say when they've got the, whichever particular VIP it is that they're protecting? They say, the package is secure. Makifoy basichloi means the package is secure. It's not going to leak out of my brain. How do you secure information? So think about this. Makif means that something is enveloped. It means it's completely surrounded from all sides. The way you completely surround something with your intellect is you examine it from different perspectives. That's how you consolidate information. Anytime a person says, okay, I know, I've got it, and you're satisfied and you're ready to move on, you can't consolidate the information. That's why. Have you ever learned Gomorrah? Many people find the Gomorrah to be so frustrating because they propose a topic and then they take this topic to pieces. A question from this verse and a question from that Mishnah. And this rabbi has a question and that rabbi contradicts his answer. And then they bring a proof this way and then they bring a proof that way. Why? Just tell me straight. What am I supposed to do? Yes or no? Kosher or trade? Just tell me straight. One of the classic responses that you get when you ask a rabbi an alachi question is, it depends. Rabbi, this is what happened in the kitchen, whatever. This is, this is the scenario on Shabbos. What's the law? It depends. What do you mean it depends? Just tell me straight. Yes or no? Do I have to throw out my kitchen? Or am I good to go? You know, is this acceptable on Shabbos or is it not? Can I drink that wine or not? Can I go to that function or not? It depends. Why? Because the whole of Torah learning trains us to be makif, besichleinu, to completely envelop a concept. That's why we revisit the same things again and again. You're going to go through Pesach again. You're going to ask the same four questions again. 
The goal is not to ask the same four questions in the same way that you asked it last year. The goal is that this year at the Pesach Seder, each of those four questions should have a completely different meaning to you. Should be seeking a completely different perspective to anything you've ever done at a Pesach Seder before. Makif Basichloi. A complete, you know, like 3D printing. Have you ever watched 3D printers? You know how the thing like kind of moves around like this and like that. You want to create a 3D image of every bit of information that you study by scanning it with all the different perspectives of your mind. That's makifoy besichloi. That's real understanding. Watching a YouTube video doesn't count as makifoy besichloi. <laughs> or as I heard somebody say the other day, somebody said, I read something in a book. And then they corrected themselves and they said, actually, I read a quotation from a book. <laughs> a lot more honest and a lot less makifoy besichloi. So what happens when you do that? What happens when you really learn, question, observe, challenge, seek different perspectives? You're not afraid to revisit. You're not afraid to raise hard questions on a topic. Then, the hamuskal, the prospect, the objective, the information, nitfas, is grasped. Omukov, and is surrounded, so in other words, it is secure. Umeluvash, and it is completely clothed. Besoich hasechel shehisigoy vehiskiloy. Comfortably, securely now held inside the intellect that worked so hard to understand this concept. So, of course, it's a very elaborate way of saying a, a, a principle that we all know. The principle is if you apply your mind, you will retain information. And it's not only retention in the sense of not forgetting, but you'll truly understand what you retain. Because unfortunately, very often, we don't truly understand what we retain. So that's the first insight that he gives us into the intellectual process. Remember, this is valuable information because... Shortly in the chapter, not shortly this evening, but shortly in the chapter, we will talk about how this all applies to understanding Torah, which is where things become very intriguing. But at this point, we're just talking simply about intellect. Now, that's all looking from the perspective of the intellectual, the person who is learning, the person who is studying, the benefit that they get, the, the way that they secure that information in their mind. It's equally interesting to look how this would how this would appear from the perspective of the information. The gamma seichel meluvash, listen to this, the musko. From the perspective of the information, the information has got you. Besha shemesigoi v'toifsoi besichloi derech moshel. At the time that you are in the process of learning, the information has you. In other words, it's a handshake. The handshake means that there are two sides coming together in a mutual connection. If I learn something very well, then I get to keep it. That means even after I close the book, even after the talk is over, I get to keep that information. It's part now of how I see the world, which is an incredibly valuable thing. But at the time of the learning, the information gets to keep me. Just during the time of the learning. But during that interaction, that's why it's, it's exactly like the internet. Everybody always, you know, when you, when you want to check if your internet is working well, you always want to make sure that you've got a good download speed. The reality is you also have to have a good upload speed. But you'll say, I'm not uploading anything. It doesn't matter. That's how connections work. Connections have to flow in both directions. So in the same way that at the time that you are learning, you're sucking in the information into your brain, and it makes it sound like you're the one who's in control, the reality is that at the time that you're learning, that information grabs you completely 
and holds you to the extent that you might not notice the passage of time or you might be oblivious to what's going on around you or if you're a real intellectual, you might even forget to eat because the information's got you. It might not happen to us often when we learn, but it could happen when you read a really good book. You can't put the book down, right? It's got you. And that's what we mean, that there's this mutual connection. There's this mutual upload-download happening every single time that we learn something in a meaningful way. Now, all of this is just to set the stage to explain to us how it works in Torah terms. So we'll start that this evening, and in Mitzvah Hashem, we'll continue it next week. So Derek Moshe, let's use an example. Let's say that there's a person who analyzes researchers, contemplates, and therefore truly understands a particular area of Jewish law as it is presented by Mishnah in the most succinct form, which is in the Mishnah, or in the very developed, complex form of how the Talmud would explain it. And we're not talking about somebody who learns in a superficial way, but rather, again, words are very important, La Ashura al Buriya. A person who learns in such a way that they have absolute clarity of the topic and of the nature of the topic, the structure of the topic, the logical flow of the topic, la ashura al buria. This is somebody, you wake them up in the middle of the night, they can tell you exactly what it is that they've studied. So now we've moved from the theoretical to a practical example of learning Torah. So somebody has done this, hare sikhloi toik face o makifoisa. That person walks out of that class, out of that session of learning, having enveloped the information of that halachic principle in their mind. They now own it. They, it's theirs. It is secure to the extent that the Gemara will even say the Torah could even be called yours. Of course, we call it God's Torah. But the person has such a handle on this particular piece of information that it could be attributed to them as if it's their teaching. Vegam, in addition to that, at the time that the person studies Torah, while you are in the process of learning that piece of Gemara, Mishnah, Halacha, whatever it is, it's not some arbitrary bit of information that's grabbed your attention and is holding your intellect focused. It's the Torah that's doing that. So what we've got to do is we've got to kind of uh, cross over from how this is in very generic terms, just how intellect works, into the specific implication of referring this back to the Torah, which is what we'll do in the next piece. But that's where we're going with this. And you could already start to think about this between now and please God the next year. You could actually start to think about this. What does that mean? What does it mean if I sit down with a piece of Gemara or I sit down with a Mishnah or I sit down with a Chumash or I sit down with a Tanya and I spend time trying to, to the best of my ability, understand what this information is all about. And then I succeed to whatever extent. And I've got this information in my head. And it's part of me. And it's part of how I see the world. What do you think that does for you as a person? Because that's going to be the next point in, in our development of this topic. We understand that it could happen with any information. Any information could become mine. And I could become the expert in any particular field. But what would be the unique impact on me? if the information that I ingest into my mind is the Torah. What does it mean for while I'm learning, when the Torah has got hold of me? And what does it mean to me after I have completed the learning, when the Torah sits secure in my intellectual repository? It's a very, very interesting concept to think about. So give it some thought between now and next week. And please God, we'll unpack it and we'll see how radical the experience of learning Torah is more than any other spiritual experience we could ever have.